Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final session of day four of the Ontario Coaches Conference, Bullying versus Conflict, Preventing Bullying in Sport. A few housekeeping items for you before we get started. This session will run until approximately 1 p.m. You may use the public session chat to ask questions throughout the presentation. There will be a few comments and moments for you to, to interact, as well as questions will be read aloud at the end of the presentation. If at any time you need assistance, you can contact the CAO team by using the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen that says contact CAO and a member of the team will get back to you. Today's session is being recorded and will be available for viewing within 24 hours from the sessions tab. Today, we are very excited to bring to you Lisa Dixon-Wells, founder of the Dare to Care program. Her work has focused on early prevention and intervention in schools reaching over 1,500 schools and 1 million participants. In 2017, Lisa expanded the program to work with Canadian amateur sport organizations. Dare to Care is the recipient of the Imagine Canada Award for Community Partnerships and the Government of Alberta Inspiration Award for Leadership in Bullying Prevention. Lisa is also a former member of the Canadian National Swim Team and holds 14 World Masters swimming titles. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Dixon-Wells. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Eric, and good morning, everybody. All right, well, I have... Um... I have about eight hours of information packed into this next hour and a half, so I forgive me if I talk a little bit quickly. Um, I also have provided Eric with a handout um, that goes along with this presentation. So Eric, I don't know if that's something that's already been distributed or if you decide after this presentation that you would like the handout, uh, I suppose you just contact Eric and he's got that or contact me. So I wanted to start off a, a little bit um, with just sort of some stats on why we need to take this issue so very seriously. This is uh, based on a Canadian study done years ago, so a couple of years ago, and it looked at all sorts of demographics, whether this was in a, a large city, small community, rural, uh, inner city. And what they found is based on the organization, whether it's school, sports, workplace, we're looking at pretty much the same statistics when it comes to bullying. And that is that roughly 15% of, in this case, a sport organization is the target of bullying behavior. And there's a lot of frightening statistics out there and have been out there for quite some time saying that 90% of kids are bullied, 80% of girls or, or women are sexually harassed. Some frightening statistics, but they're, they're based on the wrong definition of bullying. This idea that, you know, you looked at me funny once, therefore you're a bully. And I'm in a few minutes, I'm going to define bullying very carefully and talk about the difference between bullying and normal peer conflict. But based on the correct definition of bullying, we're talking about 15% of whatever sport organization you're with um, are, are actually the targets of bullying. 6% of your organization are displaying some kind of bullying behavior. But that percentage actually is very inflated, very high, because it includes what we call the followers, the posse, the minions, the puppets. These are names kids themselves have given to this group. These are the individuals, whether it's an adult or a child, who really uh, don't like being part of the bullying behavior, but in order to be part of a group, they have to go along with it. So it's almost like their, their moral compass is outweighed by their need to fit into that group. They feel uncomfortable bullying others. Um, they have great remorse over it. They're the ones who, you know, years later, track down the person they bullied and apologize. They never felt good about it. But again, that need to fit in to that group at that certain time outweighed their moral compass. So take them out of the mix. What we're left with in any organization from workplace to schools to sports is really only about 2% of your organization, your club, your team, who we would say are, are displaying bullying behavior. So a very, very small number, but they have an incredible amount of power and an incredible influence over the sort of the, the culture of, of your club, of your organization. 
we'll come back to that a little bit later. But this is the group at Dare to Care that we really are focused in on, the 79%, the silent majority, otherwise known as the bystanders. But at Dare to Care, we use the term silent majority because it speaks so much clearer to what's actually happening. It is by far the largest group, and unfortunately, by remaining silent when they witness bullying, whether it's in the locker room, in the stands, in the bus, wherever they, they witness it, um, they're staying silent. And because of that, they're actually part of the problem. So years ago, when I was developing Dare to Care back in the, the late 90s, I realized that without mobilizing this group, 79%, uh, we weren't going to change the culture of bullying. That hidden culture of bullying in sport was always, always going to be there. Or the hidden culture of bullying in, in schools was always going to be there without tapping into this resource, the silent majority. So this is a couple of other stats. Only 4% of bullying is ever reported. So it's no wonder it's, we call it the hidden culture of bullying. Uh, the main reason it's never reported or very seldomly uh, in sports is A, we, we put great onus on, uh, on physical toughness, mental toughness, and individuals are afraid to report bullying because A, they don't want retaliation, they don't want to be seen as a squeaky wheel or a crybaby by the coaches. Um, they fear that if they report it, they might be benched, they might, you know, again, be seen as problematic. So again, that it, it, it just goes unreported. Most of you have probably seen this second stat that in Canada, seven out of 10 youth are dropping out of organized sports by age 13, never return to return to organized sports again. And while bullying isn't the only reason, uh, that toxic environment, not feeling safe, not feeling included or welcome is really one of the main reasons that kids are dropping out of sport. It's not fun for them. When you talk to, to kids and why they sign up for sports and why they want to be in sports, the number one reason is to be with their friends and that sense of belongingness. Winning is way down. It's, you know, 11, 12, 13 on, on, on the list. So we really need to figure out how to create these safe, welcoming, inclusive environments for our athletes. So we're keeping them at that, that really critical age, age 13, 14, 15, when we're losing a, a large bulk of our, our athletes in this country. Um, the second, the third statistic I do want to expand on a little bit because it sort of uh, highlights the whole need for doing what we're doing. Of boys identified as bullies by age 11 to 14, 60% had some kind of criminal record by the time they were a young adult. This is a very, very old statistic. It's 1993. It's not even a Canadian statistic. But I use this all the time in presentations to set the tone of, of again, the scope of the problem and why we need to get involved. This... Um, Recently, what, what happened back, well, there's two reasons that I, I want to really share this statistic. One is because it only looked at boys back in 1993, and in fact, not until the turn of this century did researchers, pediatricians, uh, teachers, educators look at girls and bullying. And what they found once they started included girls in these studies found that girls actually had a higher correlation with criminal activity because they fly under the radar for so long. Girls are very, very covert in what they do. I mean, yes, there is physical and verbal and, and as adults we hear it, but a lot of what's going on in the world of girls and bullying is more of the alienation, social alienation, spreading of rumors, sort of that toxic um, culture of spreading rumors, leaving one out, uh, exclusion. So including girls is a relatively new in terms of, of the history of bullying is a relatively new initiative and, and talking about, again, that hidden culture amongst girls. But I wanted to look at the age group. Right up again until the last couple of decades, bullying was really sort of focused in on our 
pubescent and young adolescents. So age 11 to 14, it was sort of thought prior to that bullying didn't exist. So in elementary school or in your feeder programs for sports, your younger younger athletes, it just wasn't an issue to, to be taken seriously. But what we did was we went back into the records of this original group of boys identified by age 11, 14, and found that already by age seven, there were huge red flags. They were power oriented, not taking ownership for their behavior. So always blaming others, very egocentric, always changing rules so that they would come out on top. And I'll stop right there for any of the coaches who are working with the younger age group, sort of our seven to seven to, to 10 year olds. And I'll say, you know, a large number of your athletes would fall under the category I've just described, egocentric, power oriented, blaming others. And that's very normal, normal sort of child development right up until about age eight is to test boundaries, to blame others, to sort of figure out where you are and how you fit in this world. But by around age eight, age nine, that kind of egocentric behavior, blaming others um, shouldn't, shouldn't exist anymore. That is not normal. And there's two other factors here that we need to look at. So it's not just about being egocentric or uh, blaming others. It's also one is lack of remorse. If you have an athlete that seems to show no remorse for some of their behaviors or an adult who shows no remorse is always justifying their behavior, that is a problem. And the second factor as coaches you need to be aware of in identifying, you know, is this a child that is just kind of socially immature or is this a child, an athlete that actually is developing some bullying tendencies? The number one sort of factor to look at is the parent. Bullying is a learned behavior, 100% learned. No child is born with a stamp on their head, you shall be a bully, you know, you shall be a bully. It is 100% learned and learned through their environment, but primarily through their home and their, their primary caregivers. So as coaches, some of you have probably had this experience where you've had to deal with a bullying situation and you've need to, you had to bring in the athlete who's bullying and the parent of that athlete, and you see very, very quickly, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, that the, the child who is displaying bullying behavior has a parent who has been causing problems in the club for, for ages as well. So the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And, and the whole reason I'm, I'm bringing this study up is as coaches, as you know, the head of the organization that's really sort of setting the tone of the culture of your, of your club, of your organization, you are not doing anybody any favors by ignoring the behaviors going on very early on in, with your younger athletes. If there is bullying behavior, is there, if there's a pattern of negative behavior going on, it needs to be dealt with immediately. Um, otherwise, little bullies grow up to be big bullies and then we have to deal with them in, in a much larger, much larger scale. So again, this is not this presentation and any information or any education you are providing your athletes and parents. It needs to start right at the very beginning of your organization with the youngest of your athletes. And then that message being consistent and carried through throughout the entire organization organization, which leads me to this fourth fact, and that is just your code of conduct is absolutely critical. I'm going to be talking about this a little bit later in the presentation, but without a clear code of conduct and actionable steps that are actually followed through at every level, whether that's at the club level, provincial or national level of your sport, if there's no carry through and follow through, nothing is going to change. Um, we'll again talk more about that a little bit later. I wanted to do this, we'll see how this works. And Eric, I'm, I'm going to ask you to see if there's any uh, volunteers here. I want to read a scenario. This is going to lead us up very, very nicely, a nice segue to the next slide. Uh, a scenario and just in as few of words as possible, tell me how as a coach you would handle this. So a parent abruptly interrupts you as you are speaking to another parent. She claims that her son is the target of bullying. 
She claims the previous day a teammate had taken her son's clothes and had thrown them in the shower. The parent is now demanding punishment for her son's teammate. How should you handle it? So I'm just curious because this is a pretty common scenario in any sport. Eric, is there anyone who's willing to sort of take this on and, and answer this? Let's, uh, let's give them a few seconds and uh, let's see who comes up. So you can use the uh, the public chat there if you like to describe how you would handle that. Maybe a few words, a few comments. Feel free to type it out. If you want to wait till the end, you can certainly do that as well. But uh, let's just give it a few more seconds here, Lisa. Okay. And certainly, if we had our full, you know, two and a half hours or so, I would be doing several scenarios throughout. Um, we won't have time for that today. I just wanted to throw this one in just to get everybody's head sort of. We've got a couple. We got one here. It says uh, someone said, "Ask the parent to hold on. Um, we'll finish current conversation and say I want to speak to her privately." Someone else said, let's talk in private. Can you clarify the situation for me? May I speak to your son? Let's get input from the other child. Okay. And then someone else also said, uh, which is very, very important, using as part of the NCCP in the Make Ethical Decisions course, there's a six-step six decision-making process as a start. And I'll say one more just to wrap this up. Gather information, have open discussions with each party, and then come up with a solution to move forward. Perfect. All right, excellent. Everybody's wide awake and uh, heads are, are in the bully prevention space here. I actually put this one on. It's a bit of a trick and all of those answers are superb, um, perfect, and we'll expand on that as, as we go through the presentation. But I wanted to point out one sentence here and it will segue, like I said, to the next slide. She claims that her son is the target of bullying. Now, Based on this scenario, this is something that happened yesterday in the shower. There is no history here. It's a one-time thing. Therefore, the word bullying is completely misused. And this is huge. In, in As coaches, you are going to be getting throughout the year kids, parents, maybe other coaches, officials coming to you, talking about bullying behavior. And the very first question you need to ask is, how long has this kind of behavior been going on? Is there a pattern of behavior? So let me explain a little bit further. In every community we go to, again, whether it's school, the workplace, in a sporting community, we are getting everybody defining bullying differently and it will be impossible for you as the coach of a club or on a larger scale provincially or nationally in the sport organization, if everybody's defining bullying differently, there's no way there can be a clear and concise sort of follow through. Everybody in sports, everybody in schools needs to have this common definition and there are three factors to it. The first one, targeting an individual or group with repetitive and intentional negative actions. So a one-off incident is not bullying, which is why, again, asking that question, how long has this been going on for, finding out is there a pattern of behavior is really very, very critical. And then as coaches, starting to document that. So you have that paper trail, whether it's on your phone or a, you know, a, a written document, a paper trail that shows that there's a pattern of this negative behavior. So in, in schools, we say that if somebody is displaying negative, hurtful behavior, inappropriate behavior for a week or longer, that is no longer considered normal. That is bullying behavior. In sports, because you've got kids who are training sometimes two times a week, sometimes 11 times a week for, for our swimmers, um, it's going to vary. Your, your younger athletes who are only training a couple of times a week, I would say if that negative pattern of behavior is, is occurring over a couple of weeks of practices, we need to step in as coaches and, and as boards and follow through on uh, some sort of code of conduct and, and steps in dealing with bullying, which we'll go through. If for our older athletes in our performance and higher higher level athletes who are training multiple times a day or at least once a day, again, once if, if it's going on for a week or longer, 
again, no longer to, to be tolerated. Okay, so repetitive needs to be there. The intentional part is also very, very critical. I am going to, a little bit later on, talk about a, a rapidly growing group of kids, athletes, who we would call provocative children, who don't understand how they rub people the wrong way, and because they don't understand it, they keep doing it. And so by the very sake of them not being able to identify their own behavior or recognize their own behavior, they're always seeming, their name is always coming up as being problematic. So by the very sheer definition of it needs to be repetitive in order to be bullying, these kids are often labeled as bullies but they are not because their behavior is not intentional they are not intending to hurt people's feelings they just don't read body language they don't pick up on social cues they're lacking social skills and so it's not intentional they are not bullies and i really do want to spend a little bit of time on that group because i know every single coach on this platform today has is either dealing with a child like this or has somebody in their club who fits this description completely as a provocative child. So repetitive, intentional. Bullies are intentional. True bullies are intentional. If I was a ringette player in Alberta and I've moved to Ontario and I have found my club in Perth, Ontario, and I was a bully in Alberta on my team, I am going to thrive and strive to take on that role again in my new team. It might take me uh, a week or two because I need to figure out who I can target and who I best leave alone. I'm looking for the, the athletes I can get a reaction from because that's what gets me the most pleasure. I am intentionally targeting individuals on my team. And once I find those kids, I will go to town on them and you know, quickly get that status of being a bully. Let's face it, in our world, there's a hidden benefit to being a bully. You get what you want when you want, and nobody's going to stop you. We could all be bullies, but most of us aren't willing to take on uh, the power it, it requires to be a bully and to lock up our, our sense of guilt and remorse. Most of us would feel far too, too badly to do that. True bullies are intentional and they are repetitive. The imbalance of power has got to exist in order for us to call it bullying. In normal peer conflict, there is no imbalance of power. It's two individuals, whether it's two athletes or two parents, two coaches, officials, it's individuals who have a misunderstanding, uh, a disagreement, and they have a falling out. It usually doesn't last very long, uh, before they they kind of figure things out and work and move forward but for a day or two it could be really really nasty however it's equal power it's one person calling the other person names the other person throwing back names it's back and forth it's like this dance equal power whereas in bullying the individual being targeted has no power even less power because they look around they know that there are witnesses that silent majority they know there are people that are watching but nobody is coming to their defense and on the flip side the bully has all the power even more so because they look around they see that people are watching in fact they they thrive on people watching they need an audience and nobody's stopping them in fact, some are giggling, some are joining in, and their sense of power, you know, goes right through the roof. So again, in normal peer conflict, at any age, whether we're talking adults or kids, there is no imbalance of power, it is equal power. In bullying, it's a total imbalance of power. And this last one factor is unequal levels of affect. Affect is emotion. In normal conflict, if it's two athletes, as a coach, you're going to sense that there's something going on because usually there is emotion. It may not be the same emotion. One athlete is, is crying and the other one is angry or one's frustrated and the other one is, is bored. It, it doesn't matter. There's some emotion going on. And as a coach, that draws some attention to the issue. And then as a coach, once you sit the two down, down and start talking through the the issue you'll and once they start to calm down kids are really good at resolving conflict once they calm down and sometimes it takes you the coach to 
to get them to that calm level. I wish it were that easy in bullying. The problem is the bully is devoid of any emotion. You're not going to see emotion from the bully. They're just doing what they do because, hey, they can, they can get away with it. Um, and on again, the flip side, the athlete being targeted has all of this emotion. They've just learned at a very young age not to show it because showing emotion will make the situation worse. And that emotion is not going anywhere. That anger, that frustration, the loneliness, that sense of being invisible, of not fitting into their team, that anxiety, all of that is just manifesting and growing to the point of, again, anxiety, depression, dropping out of sports, and, and the list goes on. So it's not as coaches that you can, in, in bullying, that you will see emotion and it will draw your attention. In fact, bullying can be happening right in front of your face and you will not even know it. Uh, bullies are masterful at any age, at very young ages and, of course, in our adult group. They're a very, very manipulative bunch, very masterful at what they're doing, but understand their behavior is 100% intentional. It's all about power. It's all about power. And their behavior is repetitive as well. So I just want to share a sort of a poster we share when we're working with athletes to make it a little bit more meaningful. Mean moments is normal. As human beings, we all have mean moments. It's a one-time sort of outburst. It's usually fueled by emotion. We're upset. We're angry at, at a call. Uh, we're, you know, just had a really bad performance. And it's kind of just this explosive, all-out, very hurtful, one-sided. It's either aimed at you at the coach or another athletes or maybe aimed at their parent it's one time explosive mean moment and unfortunately in 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 our world that is no, normal we've all had those conflict is also normal it happens occasionally it's usually because of a misunderstanding it's usually between friends they were friends and will will be friends again they just have this inter you know this sort of falling out uh, it involves both parties, so again, it's that back and forth dance. It is completely normal. What is not normal is bullying. When it escalates into bullying, where it is repeated, it's on purpose, it is very one-sided and extremely, extremely hurtful. So I know I've thrown a lot of information your way, and this whole definition, all everything around it is critically important moving forward. So I'm going to stop right there and just see if... Eric, if there are any questions that have um, arisen on the chat. So Absolutely. Okay. There is a couple, there's a good one here that a few people have started commenting on. So how severe does the action have to be before we as coaches take action? From this person's experience, bullies on teams know how to manipulate people into thinking that their behavior wasn't on purpose. How do we decide between unintentional action? Well, first and foremost, when you're dealing with conflict and you sit the two parties down and you talk it through, which is a very normal problem solving approach, you can investigate both sides right there immediately. With bullying, first and foremost, coaches, you never ever, because there's an imbalance of power, you never sit the athlete and the bully down. The, the, the two down together to work it out because the bully has so much power and is so mani manipulative. Um, the child who is being targeted will not speak up. You will get the bare minimum and the bully will manipulate their way through so much so that they'll, they'll actually probably have you believing that the bully is the actual target in the situation. So you deal with them separately and as coaches, when you're talking to them separately, when you are talking to the target, the, the, the one on the receiving end, you really need to look at the impact it's having on that person. And that's what you need to take seriously, not the, the, the bully and then brushing it off and saying, oh, I was just kidding, I was just joking, or I didn't mean to do that. That's all part of their manipulation. Listen to the target and the impact it's having on the target. That's when you know when you need to act or not. And, and when we talk about the, the code of conduct, even in an initial situation, once you know that this is repetitive behavior, there needs to be some steps and procedures that all coaches need to follow through on and that the board needs to support. Um, 
that that term zero tolerance is also is is often thrown around in the world of bullying we don't use that zero tolerance that means there's no investigation it's just you bullied someone you're you're kicked off the team what we have and what i'll share with you is more of a three-step procedure once it's been identified as bullying behavior there's a, a three-step procedure it's very clear and concise that all coaches need to go through sorry that was a very long-winded answer but hopefully that satisfied that question for sure i'll go one more for you okay. um is it a common occurrence that bullies accuse others of bullying them when absolutely. the behavior was actually a reaction to being bullied absolutely yeah yeah and and that's what makes it so very tough is that uh, that that manipulation that masterful manipulation that bullies have and if it's an athlete here that's you know denying any wrongdoing and saying that they're actually the one that's being targeted i guess the biggest red flag to look for is the parent of that child is the parent of the bully also denying any wrongdoing and blaming the the organization and saying you're always picking on my family um that to me is a really red flag most parents want to work with you as coaches and and with this team to resolve issues but if a parent is coming in and supporting their child and defending their child's you know awful behavior that needs to be taken seriously. That's kind of a that's that's kind of the red the big red flag to you as a coach to know that there's some manipulation going on. Awesome. Do you want one more here, or are you going to want to continue? Uh, let's keep going. Sure. Go let's ahead. just keep going, just because there is so much still to get through here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on types of bullying. I think we all understand now that there are many many types of bullying and all of these types exist are alive and well in sports um, and and doesn't matter if it's a mixed sport like swimming or if it's a more female dominated like ring, ringette uh, synchronized swimming or if it's more male dominated um, I don't want to say any male dominated sports because, you know, of course, lacrosse and rugby are all women are included in there as well. But my point being, these forms of bullying are alive and well in every single sport. And when I first started bully prevention back in the late 90s, early 2000s, really people were only defining bullying based on physical aggression and verbal aggression and ignoring all of this, re the, the rest of this stuff. Social alienation is a big one in sport and probably the most hurtful form of bullying. It is the spreading of the rumors, the gossiping, damaging one's you know, uh, reputation, excluding from a group, and again, alive and well in every single sport. There is one type of bullying that is not on here, and I'm pretty sure you've all recognized which one is missing and that is cyberbullying and I, I do want to spend just a little bit extra time on this one. This cyberbullying goes along with the social alienation, excluding rumors, damaging one's reputation. But of course, through cyberbullying, there's also the verbal and the, the physical threats, a lot of racism, sexual harassment. Um, the reason I want to to go a little more in depth with this one is simply because I really feel it's not just athletes, but the parents of your organization, the, your fellow coaches who all need to understand that everything they're posting online, everything from comments to liking certain comments to posting of pictures, memes, etc., is creating this digital footprint and it becomes permanent and it is public absolutely public it doesn't matter what kind of privacy settings you've got everything can be found and we're seeing more and more of that um, certainly in in the world of sports athletes who are not being recruited because of their social media athletes who are losing scholarships athletes who are not welcome on teams anymore and coaches who are losing their job because of posts and you know we've got the infamous this is not uh, online but the the open mic on the hockey on our hockey official our ref who's now been banned from the nhl like they're just eyes and ears everywhere nowadays and so one thing that we spend quite a bit of time working with athletes but i want to share it with you as coaches as well 
is on helping athletes maybe stop and think before they post or comment or like or share anything online. And while I say that this is, you know, we share with the athletes, this is something as coaches, parents of an organization, that we need to take seriously as, as well. So at Dare to Care, we call it the three door challenge. And it's basically three doors with a question on each door. And you have to answer each question before you proceed, before you get to the point where you post or like or share anything. The very first question to ask is, could I say this to the person's face? Whatever it is I'm about to share on the team Snapchat or on, on somebody's I don't know, Instagram, the picture, the verbiage, the, the, the meme, whatever I'm about to share, could I actually show it to the person's face or say it to the person's face? If the answer is yes, great, go through door number one. Door number two, how would I feel if someone said this about me? So this is the empathy piece and this, in the world of cyberbullying, empathy is gone. People are just posting and liking without thinking of the consequences. So again, it's slowing down, thinking about how would I feel if somebody said those things about me or posted those things about me. Door number three is the big one. Could I stand up in front of everyone on my team, including all of my coaches, my teammates, my parents, and the police and read out what I am, what I'm about to share, or show the picture to everyone uh, before I post it. Could I do that and be okay with it? If the answer is yes, you're great to go. Post, share, like, comment. You're you're good to go. But if the answer is no to any of these, you stop, because again, everything we share is public and it is permanent. And it if it if it is negative it will come back to haunt us at some point. So I just wanted to share that with you uh, so you can get sort of a little sense of what we do with the athletes, um, which is very, very different than this more just PowerPoint presentation for coaches and parents. This is a big one, provocative targets. These, uh, I do want to devote a little bit of time to this because these are the kids on your team who are the most misunderstood, mislabeled, um, mistreated by other athletes, by parents, by officials. And these are some awesome, awesome kids. These are in school. So because Dare to Care started off in school and my whole background was a school counselor. Um, when I first started with Dare to Care, I would say that I would see maybe two or three provocative I'll say children, in every school. I now see three or four or five in every single classroom. So it makes sense that in sports, you are also, for those coaches out there who have been around for a decade or longer, um, you've probably seen a, a rise in these, in these kids. These kids are wonderful, wonderful human beings. They're very restless. And because of their restlessness, they often irritate others without really knowing that they're doing it. They don't have a filter. They may have heard a really rude, crude adult joke and heard adults laugh. So they come and share it on their team and everybody's disgusted with them, but they don't pick up on those cues that this was a disgusting joke. So they keep trying, they try to be the class clowns. They, they want so badly to fit in, they will do whatever it takes. The problem is the harder they try to fit in, the more they seem to be rejected. They tend to fight back in bullying situations. Um, and it's only because these kids are probably the most picked on in sports. They don't fit in. They're, they're kind of like the, the square peg trying to fit into the round hole. They stand out like a sore thumb. There's a couple of, uh, there's a lot of social skills missing, but a couple of them, they have a loud voice. They interrupt a lot. Uh, they don't understand personal space. That's a big one. They don't like people in their personal space, but they're all over everybody else's personal space. And they don't pick up on social cues. And this is, this this is really important. So, and that includes tone of voice. So when tone of voice changes for you as a coach, if you're frustrated with them, they will not pick up on that change in your tone of voice. And so they'll still lull around and take their time getting ready to start practice and hold everybody up, but they don't hear the urgency or the anger or frustration in their, in your voice. So to you as a coach, it sounds 
it, it feels like they're being really defiant and rude, but that is actually not what's going on. They're missing those social cues that's telling them, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, or stop interrupting, or leave me some personal space, you're too close to my space. So because they're always, always being rejected and picked on, eventually they do fight back, whether it's verbally or physically, because, and, and they're the one that ends up getting in trouble, maybe, you know, getting consequenced or kicked off the team, because nobody will support them, nobody stands up to them or for them, sorry, nobody stands up for them. So they're fighting this battle, these dear little kids are fighting this battle all alone, and they're smart enough to know that they don't fit in, they just can't figure out why, what it is that they're doing. It's social skills, social skills, social skills. And the great thing is social skills can be taught. Now, as coaches, this is really not your job. You'll have teachable moments, and I'll, I'll give you an example in just a moment. You'll have teachable moments all the time to help these kids, but this goes much, much deeper. And this is something that when we do parent sessions in, in sport clubs, and we talk about provocative children, and always afterwards, I have a lineup of, well, when I used to be able to do the in-person presentation, lineup of parents saying, when you talked about provocative children, you described my child to a T. What do I do? These parents are at a loss. They don't know what to do with their children. Um, they need to get outside resource. So resources from school, resources from the community itself in the area of social skills, self-esteem. Um, there's lots of social groups popping up throughout the country uh, that do summer camps, let's say, with social skills as sort of the, the backbone of the sub summer camp, the, the agenda. It says here they uh, may be diagnosed with ADD, be gifted on the autism spectrum. There, it, it doesn't really matter what the diagnosis is. The bottom line is what is causing the most grief for these kids is that lack of social skills. And until they start to work on those social skills and improve those social skills, they will always be that provocative individual. And they grow up to be adults. And we all know of adults who would fit this category that nobody wants to hang out with. They're kind of, the two words that are most often used to describe provocative individuals is that they're annoying, they don't know when to stop, and they are weird. Unfortunately, those are the two words. And my heart goes out to these kids because they are amazing. One-on-one, -on -one, you can have great conversations with these kids. They are bright. They are super, super bright. Um, but put them in a social setting and it's like they fall apart. These kids really do not do well in team sports at all. So it, I, another reason for a mass exodus, sort of around age 11, 12, they're not having fun. They're excluded all the time. This is, and they could be a great athlete. These kids have potential to be fantastic athletes. And because my background is swimming, I will say Michael Phelps fit 100% into this category as a swimmer. Um, was not liked by his coach. They had a lot of falling out, was not liked by fellow swimmers. Um, and again, you know, he, he, through his years and successes and coaching, started to, to develop more and more social skills, but it caused him great grief and a lot of anxiety and, and depression along the way. So I am bringing this up because, again, these kids are in your clubs, in your organizations, your associations, and as coaches, it would be easy to dismiss them as annoying and maybe even label them as bullying because, again, their name always seems to come up as being in the heart of some sort of conflict. But, again, the repetitiveness is there. Intentionality is not. These kids have very, very low self-esteem. I, I, I want to stop right there and just say throw away anything you've ever read that says that people who bully – have very low self-esteem and they bully to feel better about themselves, that is a complete myth. 
bullies, true bullies, that 2%, true bullies have a very inflated self-image. They feel very good about themselves. And the longer they get away with this behavior and there are no consequences, the bigger and bigger and bigger their sense of power um, and distorted thinking becomes. They become able to justify everything they do, which is why later on in life, often they have a run-in with the law because they push the boundaries. They feel like they have the right. Um, narcissism comes to mind. These individuals, true bullies, often display narcissistic, some narcissistic behavior, especially by the time they're an adult. Whereas a provocative child, while their behavior is inappropriate and repetitive, the intentionality is not there. They have a very low self-esteem. They honestly don't know what they're doing is wrong. Uh, this very last bullet here tend to make adults feel like they deserve it. I, I need to figure out a better way to describe this, but what I'm trying to say is as adults, we don't have a lot of patience for these kids and it shows in the language we use, our tone of voice with them and the rest of their teammates pick up on this. And in the teammates mind, it's like the coach doesn't even like this kid. So why should I? So all I'm asking as coaches is you be aware that these kids exist in your organization and you just reframe a little bit and understand these kids aren't doing this on purpose, that constant chatter and interrupting and, you know, just inappropriate behavior is not intentional. It doesn't make it a lot easier for you as a coach, but sometimes just reframing will give you a little bit more patience. I want to give you one example here of, of you know, these kids are very, very visual. You can lecture to them all you want. Stop interrupting, stop interrupting, and it will go in one ear and out the other, which again comes across as being very rude and defiant and annoying. Um, it's They don't learn that way. They're not really hearing you. They are visual. So behavior charts, role playing, um, videotaping them, if you were able to videotape them at, a, you know, a competition, at a swim meet, at a, a tournament, it, with the permission, obviously, of the parents, videotaping them, interacting with others, and then show them that videotape, that's when they learn. That's when they're able to sort of remove themselves from the situation and, and see what's going on. So the example I want to give you is actually, it happened a couple of years ago. My daughter was a swim coach and uh, she had a young boy. She was the sort of seven to nine year old age group. She had a young boy who absolutely fell into this category and it didn't matter how many times she reminded him and reminded him you know the next practice he was back at it or several times within that same practice he was back at it he had a lot of social skills deficits but one of the problems was it questions he asked copious copious amounts of questions part of it was just his personality and part of it was to delay getting into the water and even once practice started he would ask questions and you know interrupt the whole lane and interrupt uh, interrupt the practice so she pulled him aside and said listen I'm going to now allow you three non-swimming related or workout related questions every practice and on the whiteboard uh, where she wrote down the workout she would put a check mark and only he knew what those check marks were and none of the kids seemed to care or know. And that was a visual for him. And sure enough, before work had even started, probably two of the three questions had been asked and he would dive in and, and not long after the third question would pop up and my daughter would simply say, you've got two check marks. Are you sure you want to waste your third check mark? And he'd go, nope. And he'd push off and continue with the set. It took about three weeks and then they no longer needed the check marks. He was able to self-regulate that copious amounts of, of questions. So, you know, you could have, if you've got a kid who's interrupting all the time, maybe a, a some sort of visual cue to remind them. So, you know, maybe a timeout sign, some sort of visual cue that you talk over with the kid that they see that when you do it, it means, hey, you're interrupting again. These kids, um, it's kind of cute, but also very annoying, is they take a long time to explain things. So my son, 
fell into this category of provocative children and he's doing great now he's he, he I never would have thought that he would be in a um, hospitality industry uh, because socially when he was young he really really struggled and one of the things that he struggled with is again tell, like, taking way too long to explain himself or to tell a story so we just kept, came up with this visual cue and, and verbal cue short version it's just a Tanner short version. And to this day, you know, sometimes we use that and he's he's awesome. We did a lot of work on social skills and, and again, he's he's a complete success story, which is why, again, I feel so compelled to talk about these kids when I'm talking in schools to uh, teachers, when I'm talking to coaches and to parents. We need to understand these kids and give them the social skills. Otherwise, it's it's a very lonely and frustrating life for them. Any questions here? Because I'm going to sort of shift gears uh, at this point. But any questions on provocative individuals? We've got a couple here for you, Lisa. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with just uh, the most recent one. So what is the best way to help these kids gain some perspective on their actions? And how can you help them see they could be pushing others away? Yeah, and, and it, there still be, needs to be consequences. You know, if their behavior is disruptive, hurting others, inappropriate, you know, consequences just like there would be in any other conflict. It's just, you know, be careful to not label it bullying. Um, can a provocative child be a bully? I would say the possibility is there. I have never seen it. A, because their self-esteem is low, and B, they do not have a support group, their, their posse, to sort of build their power. So, um, and, and again, having those teachable moments, pulling them aside and, and explaining to them in a visual format, you could even role play with them, depending on what the, what the issue is. Uh, role play with them where you pay, play them and so that they can step outside of their body and see how they're they're responding. I don't I don't know if that makes sense, but um, again, just lecturing them does not work. So it's more of the visual cues, visual cues, behavior charts, anything like that you can think of. Awesome. I will let you continue on. All right. So if we had uh, the, the full session time, I would spend a little more time about parents and sports and that list of nightmare parents whom many of you have, have come across. And certainly when we do parent sessions in sports, we, we spend a lot of time on parents and holding themselves accountable and reflecting once in a while about what their goal is. I, I love this quote poster. Sports should be about kids and their passion, not parents. And sometimes parents just need a little bit of a reminder. I did have a video that I wanted to share at this point, but just before uh, the session, Eric and I were playing around and technology was not our friend this morning. So Eric is going to post. It's called The Truth About Sport Parents. And every sport parent should see it, whether they're a fantastic supportive sport parent or that toxic sport parent it's just a brilliant sort of six minute video so please take a look at the link that that uh, eric will will provide but we as in schools as well as sports whenever we're doing anything about talking about the culture of the team that we want or the school we want we have to include the parents in that dialogue and in that education and parents need to be held accountable as well and you'll see that when i get to the code of conduct in in the next 15 minutes or so um, here are some common coaching characteristics that we share with parents that they need to understand like earlier on in this presentation i talked about parents defining bullying in so many different ways and and over using the words and misusing the word bullying. They need to understand that once they sign their child up for sports, there are going to be some things a coach is going to demand from their child that a parent might think is bullying, but is actually a normal, appropriate uh, approach in, in, in sports. Um, I won't read these, I'll just let you read them.
playing a child in an unfamiliar position or entering them in events. I, I mean, as again, a swim mom, that happened all the time, of course, is uh, parents getting very upset because they felt like the coach was entering their child in an event that their child wasn't mentally or physically ready for. Coaches know their athletes and parents need to understand that and stay in their lane. Uh, I think, oh yeah, I, I'm just giving you a sample of some of the characteristics. The list is much, much longer than this. And in the handout, I think I, I've listed a, another, you know, seven or eight characteristics. But again, just wanted you to get a sense of some of the things we talk about when we, we do our parent session. For coaches, you know, we, you've probably seen this before, a coach will impact more young people in a year than the average person does in a lifetime, which is pretty incredible. But again, as coaches, we need to self-reflect and ask ourselves, what kind of impact are we having? How do you want to be remembered as a coach? Because you will be remembered. The coaches of the younger kids, you'll be remembered as starting them off. The, our more senior coaches, our national team coaches, you are going to be remembered by every single athlete you coach. How do you want to be remembered? As uplifting, positive, you know, more focused on the sport and, and sports the learnings that come with sports are more focused on winning and, you know, what kind of strategies and techniques did you enforce in order to get that, that high performance? Again, again, that, that question, how do you want to be remembered? Um, bullying behaviors in coach, in coaching, repeatedly verbally abusing children, intimidating an athlete or group on a regular basis. You're going to see a theme here, repeated questioning an athlete's ability, repeatedly setting unrealistic goals, repeatedly. Okay, so you, you see the theme here. You are going to have bad days. You're going to have explosive days. Those mean moments, that is normal. You are going to have conflict with athletes. You're going to have conflict with officials. You're going to have conflict with parents. That is normal. What is not normal is when it it escalates into bullying, where there's that power imbalance and that behavior is repeated and intentional. So again, as coaches, self-reflecting and holding each other, coaches, fellow coaches, to a much, much higher standard. So this is where I want to shift gears to more of, okay, so what do we do? Now that we know what bullying is, what do we do uh, when we have a, an incident, whether it's athletes, whether it's, it's parents, how do we handle it? If we had time, I would have done, and, and if we were live, I would have done or had you do a uh, conflict resolution questionnaire, which many of you probably have done at some point in your life. And there are five major conflict resolution styles. All have significance and importance depending on the day and what you're doing and what role you're playing. In sports, problem solving and compromising are the two big ones. And that's in day-to-day in -day conflict, that's sitting two parties down and you know exploring their emotions and coming up with a solution. Problem solving, compromising, great. And I know without having you do this survey that probably 80% of you, 85% of you would come out on top on this survey that you're, you're number one uh, sort of comfort technique, conflict resolution technique is problem solving approach. Number two would be compromising and many of you would have a tie between those two. And which is great, keep doing that in day to day, your role as coach in day to day life. However, if it is a bullying situation, you all, every coach on your team has got to switch over to a no nonsense approach. So what does no nonsense mean? It is really just these two bullets right here. Give brief, clear descriptions of the unacceptable behavior that you've heard about or have witnessed. Keep it short. Number two, do not have a long discussion of the situation. So the reason for that is in normal day-to-day -day conflict, you would sit them both down and go through the process of asking each each individual what happened, their side of the story, gather that information. 
In bullying, you need to understand that when a bully is caught, their first line of defense is to deny any wrongdoing and to, to, to spin the truth. And the longer you stand there and question them and explain why their behavior is wrong, the more time they have to engage you in a power struggle and to spin that truth. So you keep it short and it's basically just either, I saw what you did, it will not be tolerated, go do laps and we'll talk about this in, in 10 minutes. Or I've heard from others that you're displaying bullying behavior, it will not be tolerated, we are going to talk about it, but first go do your warm up. You don't wanna talk about it immediately because you're angry and they're angry and that's when it can escalate very, very quickly. So give them some time but do not have a long explanation at that that immediate moment when you're when you identify the bullying behavior. Just say what you did will not be tolerated. We will be talking about this at the end of practice or sometime during practice, or I'll be calling you later tonight. The one thing I do want to say, and and this is hot, this is difficult. However, it's really really important. In conflict, and in most sports, we have that 24-hour rule that if there's conflict, you wait 24 hours before you send that email or you respond. When it's a bullying situation, there needs to be movement. As soon as it's been identified as bullying, some movement towards some sort of code of conduct, following the code of conduct, as soon as possible, like that day. Whether it's having a phone call, whether it's um, jotting down the, you know, the the details of the the situation and having this short you know conversation with the athlete or the parent saying what you did what occurred will not be tolerated we will be talking about this i will be documenting it um, expect a phone call or an email or a meeting within the next 24 hours um, does that make sense to everybody it needs to be acknowledged you don't need to deal with it right away, but it needs to be acknowledged right away. And then, most importantly, there needs to be follow through. Don't forget about it the next day and get busy in your day-to-day -day life. It There needs to be follow through because if we want to mobilize the masses and get them to start reporting bullying, or even better, stepping in before it escalates into bullying, they need to know that when they report bullying, it's going to be dealt with. So I'm, I, I wish I could see your faces and see if there's any comments right now, but that is critical. A, it's dealt with or, or acknowledged immediately, and then it begins to be dealt with within 24 hours. That's sending such a strong message to the rest of the organization that this club, this organization association will not tolerate bullying behavior. So keep it short and simple. Do not get long-winded because the longer you stand there to try to explain yourself and explain why this won't be tolerated, the longer that athlete and or parent has to engage you in a power struggle. And I have seen this over and over. Once they've engaged in a power struggle, um, sadly, you will lose. They're, they're just that masterful. And I'm only talking about 2% here. So it's, it's a very small number of people that you need to deal with in this way. Um, set the culture of the team through the caring majority. It is the first six weeks of every season where the new bully target dynamics start to be created. And I'm not saying that old dynamics from the previous year won't carry over, but the new dynamics will start within the first six weeks because of new coaches, new athletes, athletes moving into new age groups, new parents coming into the mix. First six weeks are critical, and that is in every organization, every team, the first six weeks is when you should make it extremely clear, have, have uh, you know, take a half hour or so of, of a practice within the first six weeks to review the code of conduct around bullying and to talk about the definition of bullying and just how this club will proceed if they hear of any bullying behavior. First six weeks, very, very critical. And then reminders throughout the year, obviously. Um, so that caring majority is just the, the mobilized silent majority who now know that this club uh, needs them to speak up.
And then finally, you need to have a clear and concise code of conduct, which we'll get to in one moment. But because this is this is big, and um, you know, I'm obviously flying through it. Are do we have any questions about the no nonsense style? I don't think at this time. I do have a question that potentially uh, relates to this topic. Is is what kind of questions would you ask for clarification and understanding to someone who's reporting the bullying? Uh, first, very first question, how long has, well, first question would be who's involved? And second question, how long has this been going on? So figure out, is there history? Is there a pattern of behavior? Um, and then third is getting the details and documenting those details. So you have the paper trail. Awesome. I'll see another quick one here. Um, is dealing with something right away, is this a good strategy even if it's not bullying? Or is it best, if it's not known yet, if it's not known if it's bullying behavior, do you still do the 24 hours? Well, I, I think that it is really good to, acknowledge, whether it's conflict or bullying, it's good to acknowledge it some somehow that there's been an incident, you know, whether that is uh, contacting the, the athlete's parents and saying there's been an incident, um, we're going to investigate, uh, you know, but just know that we are following through on this. I don't think that you, in, in a bullying situation, because there's anger um, from the bully, and, and you need to understand they're angry at you for acknowledging or even, you know, mentioning that they're involved in bullying, but they're doubly angry at their target because in their distorted mind, it is the target's fault that the bully got caught. Um, so they're doubly angry at the bully or at the, at the target. And so if you are dealing with it right away, a bullying incident, and you're not able to make sure that the target is, is protected in the locker room when you send the bully back into the locker room, um, don't deal with it right then and there. Make sure it's the bully is isolated and not able to get to the target. They can always go on, on the cyber world and torment the tar target there. But you'll see um, in the code of conduct, there needs to be a statement. And this is a code of conduct, Eric, I can't remember if I shared it with you, but I'm happy to share it with anyone who wants it. It's a sample code of conduct that we developed over the year when we were doing our pilot project in sport. And part of that part of that code of conduct clears stately any false reports will be dealt with, there will be consequences, and any retaliation uh, for reports of bullying will be dealt with and there will be consequences. So again, that needs to be part of your, your code of conduct. So that 24 hour rule is more just to let obviously uh, emotions calm down a little bit and to let you as coaches and maybe board uh, investigate a little bit further. So I think it's a good rule, but acknowledge the incident um, that needs to happen immediately. Sounds good. I'll let you continue. Okay. Um, Oh, there's so much more here. Okay, so let me talk about the code of conduct, policies and procedures, code of conduct. Every code of conduct I have seen, whether it's sports or schools, is um, the issue of bullying is sort of lost in the larger code of conduct. And bullying is so pervasive and so crippling and damaging to an organization, so toxic, it requires its own code of conduct or policies and procedures. It really, really does. If it's just a paragraph sort of locked into the larger code of conduct, it doesn't, um, it doesn't state it well enough. It doesn't make it clear enough to, to your club members that bullying is taken seriously. The other part of this is at the beginning of a season, in, in most sports, the beginning of the season also sort of coincides with the beginning of school around that same time in the fall. Parents are inundated, absolutely inundated with documents to sign, you know, payments to be made, and they're not reading any of the documents. They're signing off on it and having their athlete, in this case, the code of conduct, their athlete sign off on, but nobody's really reading it. 
my thought around the code of conduct and bullying is it should be sent out separately and later on and I'm talking maybe three four weeks once the season has started so that parents see that this is something that is being taken very very seriously it's not just a paragraph in the bigger code of conduct or expectations of the club so hold off on that and I would love to share the the actual doc the, the text of the the code of conduct with you and Eric I'll, I'll send that to you to to share with anyone who might be interested but the other issue that I've seen in the code of conducts is not just that it's kind of lost in the bigger code of conduct is that it's just verbiage and there's no actionable steps why will people report bullying? Why will our silent majority start reporting bullying and becoming a caring majority if there's no follow through? Their reports just go lost and the bullying continues on. The steps, the, the clear, concise steps that coaches and the board need to follow um, need to be known to the athletes and to the parents. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. So we've got steps in dealing with athletes who display bullying behavior. Once it's determined that there's repetitive behavior, this is not just conflict, it's repetitive. The primary coach will meet with the athlete, the code of conduct will be reviewed. And in that code of conduct, it should have the definition of bullying. Um, it should talk about the types of bullying. So it really is a document unto itself. Parents and the head coach will be contacted, incident will be documented, and then filed with the board. Hopefully, the athlete realizes, okay, can't do that anymore, the, the, the club's taking this seriously, and that's it. But let's say they blow it off, and they go, they, it happens again. It's the same behavior or something equally as disturbing. Now it becomes a little more formal. More pe it's an investigation. Um, more people are included in the meeting, an actual meeting with the athlete and the parent of that athlete. Code of conduct is reviewed and incident, I should highlight the word documented in red again. Um, document, document, document and file with the board. Again, you hope that's it. If the child still doesn't take it seriously, now it is the final warning. We've done everything we can as a club, as a team, as an organization. We love your performance, you're a great athlete, but we will not um, tolerate it anymore. If we have any more incidents, this is your final warning. Next time you will be gone and here it is. Athlete is suspended or removed from the organization. The meeting is documented and filed with the organization. Um, it's clear and concise and, and nobody, nobody can say if, you know, your parents and your athletes can't say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know third time I'd be kicked out. This is all part of your code of conduct and it's shared with your athletes and parents so they know there is an actual procedure. I want to go back to step number one, the primary coach. The reason I put primary coach is uh, I've got an analogy that I hope makes sense to you, and it goes right back to a show from the 50s called uh, Father Knows Best. And even though I'm not that old that I've seen this show, but I've heard enough about it, it was a classic sort of 50s stereotypical show where father went to work. It was a middle class Caucasian family. Every day, father went, went to work with his little lunch bag and his briefcase. Mom, the moment she woke up, she had her makeup on and her heels and her dress and, and an apron that stayed on all day and I swear until she went to bed that night. In this show, there were three teenage sons. And whenever, because dad was absent during the day, whenever the teenage son stepped out of, out of line, the mother would say, wait till your father gets home. So what that implied when it came to consequences or discipline was that father knows best, mother knows nothing. You bring that into your sport organization. If your primary coach, and I truly understand some of the primary coaches are like 15 years old. If the primary coach is not part of this procedure, they will not be given the respect from the parents and, and the bully or the athletes. They need to be part of this this procedure. However, they need to let the head coach know what's going on, one, so the head coach knows, and two, so the head coach can support them moving, moving forward. 
Um, so please, head coaches, don't just jump in and take over. Include that primary coach. So it's kind of like substitute teachers in school are never, ever really treated with, with respect, even though the code of conduct in school includes what happens in the lunchroom. Um, substitute teachers aren't really included in the code of conduct or the procedures at school so they're not given that sort of that sort of respect i just had an incident last week with a club here in alberta uh, around sexual harassment in their performance group and the primary coach he talked to the boys involved he talked to the all the boys in the primary or the uh, performance group he documented it However, he failed to let the head coach know. And then when it escalated two months later, the head coach was completely out of touch with what had happened. And um, it escalated far worse than it should have or could have or would have if the head coach had been contacted and let known you know, immediately um, by the primary coach. So this is kind of, this is step by step and the document that I'll share, the code of conduct, it, it expands on each of these steps a little bit, but for the slide, I just sort of did the highlights. And you'll see that we've got the steps in dealing with parents who display bullying behavior. It's, it's kind of the same thing. Any individual on the, on the organization can report incidents to the primary coach. Primary coach is obligated to report directly to the head coach who will then meet with the parent the board will be notified of the incident and it will be documented and hopefully that's it. But if the parent continues, you'll see just, just like with the athlete, um, more it becomes more formal. And by the third incident, the final warning is given and the family, the parent is barred from the sporting organization and possibly the family because Bullying's roots run deep and it might be easier to bar the entire family, but we don't want to jump to that conclusion. It's, it's unfair to, to bar the athlete if really the athlete is in, in, uh, innocent in that situation. We have to have the steps for the coaches as well. And you'll just see it's, it's kind of the same thing. First step, the parent or the athlete who has issue with coach needs to talk directly to the coach first and foremost. And sometimes that's all it takes. Parent documents it, gives it to the board. It's done. Um, often that's all that needs to happen. The coach changes their behavior and we never have to move on into these next steps. The one thing that is not showing up on this slide at the bottom of every, whether we're talking about athletes, parents, or coaches, it at any point, the police could be contacted. Consequences can be given at any point, any step, and the police could be contacted. Obviously, if it's a physical assault, if it's sexual in nature, um, if it's against the law, if there's some sort of breach of, of a criminal code, uh, you do not need to go through all the steps, even if it's in the very first step and it's a, an assault in the locker room, the police could be involved. If it's a one-time thing, a one punch, one you know physical assault, it doesn't fall under the, the definition of bullying because it was one time, but it, it is an assault and there are potentially criminal charges that can be laid. So again, in the full document that I'll share with the, with uh, Eric, the, the police, the comment about the police is included in there. Uh, Eric, what? Quickly, text my time. Okay, Eric, are there any questions around code of conduct? No nonsense. The other question I've got about no nonsense here is would you ever suggest using no nonsense style without it being bullying? Yeah, it's it's just the problem is with no nonsense is really where you um you keep it short and simple. You're not opening up that opportunity for problem solving, which in normal conflict, you need to hear both sides. Uh, same with bullying, you need to hear both sides, but you have them separate. You're not sitting them down together. So I would say no nonsense is more of the initial step that you take, which is not to allow yourself to be in a position to get engaged in a long-winded um, conversation where the bully or the bully's parents are able to, you know, spin the truth. Um, 
so it's a tr I, I would say whatever you're doing in your day-to-day -day life keep doing it because that's your comfort zone and if it's working it's working when it escalates into bullying however a hundred percent of your coaches need to go to the no nonsense and for most coaches that will be fine it will be easy for them to do that to keep it short and simple for some coaches that goes against you know we want to help people and we want to please people and we want to hear both sides of the story immediately and you know it, it just in a bullying situation that doesn't work it's it's a skill to be able to handle a bullying situation properly and the no nonsense is is really the critical step keep it short keep it simple and would this also apply to working with someone with parents as well in the context yeah there you yeah. go. I'll let, I'll swing it back to you and then we'll follow up with some more questions at the end. Yeah, there was something I was going to mention and now it's gone completely out of my mind here. Um, around the code of conduct. I know I'll think of it as soon as I finish and it will make me so mad that I didn't share with you. Um, one, th this is not it, but it might inspire my, my thought locked in my, my brain here. One thing that parents need to understand as well is they should never, ever go to the parent of the bully uh, that's bullying their child or a parent who's bullying in the stands. They need to go to the coach and the coach needs to handle it. And the reason is, and you see it in all the videos of how quickly... Uh, when we're talking about children and our own children, parents are protective and defensive, and it can escalate so incredibly quickly. So even if the parent is best friends with the other parent, they need to go through, you know, go through the coaches and let the coaches handle that. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be able to think of <laughs> what what my statement was, but uh, coaches, really, you are setting the tone. The board supports you in setting that tone for your club and the athletes and the parents within that club. And that first six weeks is critical, the teachable moments throughout the year. So having, you know, reminders throughout the year about bullying and that it will not, not be tolerated, that code of conduct really that's at the board level um having that clear concise board uh, uh, code of conduct with actionable steps is going to support you as coaches in following through in a no-nonsense approach because you know the steps are there and the board will, will back you on that documenting 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 so i th think that is about it for me we had another very brilliant video at the end Hold on here the burger is there because it was it's a burger king commercial and eric will share the link a burger king commercial uh, from a couple of years ago and everybody in the burger king except for a few actors it's a group of boys who are actors and they're they're picking on a boy in the burger king and two employees of the burger king are actors and they're really kind of jerks the rest of the burger king clientele the customers are real customers and they have no idea that there's hidden cameras and the whole idea of the video is to show how seldom people whether it's adults or children actually step in when they see something going on in the community whether it's in sports whether it's at tim hortons whether it's at the the mall how rare we all see it but how rarely we step in and we all know the research has clearly stated that any kind of bullying or interruptive rude behavior will stop within 10 seconds 90% of the time when somebody just steps in and says, cut it out. You don't have to solve the issue. You don't have to follow the person, the bully home and make sure that they never do it again. Just speaking up and saying you need to stop or you need to cut it out will stop incidents uh, from escalating 90% of the time. And so this Burger King commercial, and Eric, you've seen it, So, and, and I know you love the commercial, um, please take a moment to... To, to watch the commercial, it is something that we share at the end of all of our athlete sessions as well to encourage them and parent sessions to encourage them to start speaking up. It's no longer okay to stay silent. It's just not an option. 
So with that, unless there are any other questions. Um, We've I got a couple of questions here. So just for everyone's reference, um, I did just post the YouTube link in the public chat there. It will also be posted as a downloadable MP4 in this session. Uh, but if you want to watch the video right now, you can click on the YouTube link there. Um, in the meantime, I do have a couple of questions just to follow up, but we've got a few minutes. Um, how do you deal with bullying if it's at the board of directors or president's level? Yeah. So as a coach, how do you how do you deal with it? Again, the, the first step is to go to that board member on your own, not at a board meeting, and address your concerns. Uh, give them that opportunity to change. Do not stand there, and if they get abusive, if they if if it truly is a bullying situ situation and they're getting abusive, you have the right to walk away. You can say when you're ready to calm down, I'll, I'll talk to you. Uh, you do have the right to walk away, and then and document. No, no matter what, if you walk away or you stay there and talk to them, document that you have approached them and and you know aired your differences out. If it stops, great. If it doesn't, then your next step would be to then go and present it to the board. And, and then the board gets involved, yeah. I've got two more for you while we still got a few minutes. What is the best way to handle parents who have a misconception of what bullying really is? To have a parent session and have me um, do a nice two and a half hour session with the parents. Every parent after walking out will have a common language around bullying and there will be no loops or hoops that they, you know, um, they can jump through because it will be very, very clear to them what is considered to be bullying, what will be tolerated and what, what won't be tolerated. It, the education piece is really, really critical. And then having that code of conduct to back up the education piece. Awesome. We've got a question here about if there's a situation where a child has been removed from the team, they quote unquote, grow up and mature and learn their lessons. How can they try again when they're older? Or how do you reintegrate them? Yeah, and I think that this needs to be, uh, you know, if they've been removed, so that that three steps, they've been given the final warning, and then it's removed, they're removed, and that's documented and kept with the with the board um, or somebody that that's always there. When that if that child comes back, that athlete comes back five years from now, it's going to be a different board. They're not going to know of that child, and therefore, you know course they, they let that child in if it's documented um, that should be sort of red flagged and then it becomes you know it really becomes a common sense thing with the with the board and the coaches are they willing to give that athlete you know are, are they willing to give that athlete an, another try I would say please do give them a try but it now it becomes zero tolerance um, you know one incident and, and they're gone Awesome. One quick question that just came in and some people are talking about it is how would you use a recording in a meeting with a parent and the child and the coach? Do you recommend that and how would that work? Yeah. So the incident I was talking about uh, last week with a club where it was sexual harassment, um, the coach actually did a Zoom meeting with the two girls who had the complaint, who felt like their complaint wasn't listened to, um, sat down with the president of the board, the head coach, and the the kids, the, the two girls' primary coach, and recorded the Zoom meeting, but made sure, so they could share it with me, so that I could then work with the organization and, and you know, come up with a, a solution here. But uh, it, it's just about getting permission you you have to have permission uh whoever you're recording have permission it's in their best interest really but a bully probably will say no because they they their nose is out of joint that they're having this meeting in the first place they don't see what they did as being wrong they did what they did because they had to 
Awesome. Thank you. I think we're going to end it there for questions, uh, just to wrap up for everyone. So, of course, we want to thank everyone for attending this very informative and insightful presentation. Uh, Lisa, we'll download all the great chat features here for you to hear all the amazing great. comments. Um, all of the documentation that Lisa had mentioned and the videos will be posted in this session that you can come back to as well as watch the recording within up to 24 hours after. I do want to remind you that the next session of OCC 21, Mindfulness for You and Your Athletes, takes place tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with Aaron McLeod, two-time Canadian Olympian, and Dr. Rachel Linval from The Mindful Project. Just as a note, if you've missed a past session, recordings are available for all of March 24th, 25th, and 26th sessions. You can find them in the Sessions tab. And be sure to also check out what the networking tab from the menu and you can start meeting new friends from across Canada if you haven't taken advantage of it yet. Send a private message, start a video call, or even start your own group discussion all conference long. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Lisa again. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a pleasant Saturday. Take care. Thank you, Eric.